Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the least important recordings ever. And this is a real exercise in leastitude. It is Claudio Abbato's Beethoven, all of it, but particularly his Berlin Beethoven. Well, his DG Beethoven, his, oh, he did so much and so badly or so uninterestingly, so insignificantly. And that's the point, isn't it? Let's start, let's start with sort of the beginning of complete cycles. I'm not worried about individual performances. Actually, his best version of the ninth was on Sony and it was a singleton performance, but we're not even gonna go there because that doesn't matter either. None of it matters. He began his life as a Beethoven cyclist in Vienna with Deutsche Grammophon. There was a cycle with the Vienna Philharmonic. Now, the Vienna Philharmonic is, as you know, Deutsche Grammophon's go-to Beethoven orchestra. You know, if you can't get Berlin, you do Vienna. And somehow they're supposed to be really good at Beethoven because Beethoven lived in Vienna and they're in Vienna. Get it? I mean, the fact that Beethoven lived in Vienna you know, 300 years ago, and it, it, it's it, 200 and some odd years ago, whatever it was, it was hundreds of years ago, I don't even care. It doesn't matter because none of it matters. His Beethoven was somewhat, well, he was always a bad Beethoven conductor. In fact, Abbato was basically a bad conductor in music of the classical period. That doesn't mean he didn't have his moments. He couldn't do things well once in a while, as we shall see. But most of the time, as Mozart, as Haydn, he was far too interventionist, far too mealy-mouthed, far too too interested in 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 superficial prettiness and slickness and not as interested enough in things like bass lines and counterpoint. You know what I mean? The stuff that classical period music is kind of like based on, you know? Anyway, so his Beethoven always lacked gumption. It lacked force and drive and fierceness and rhythm and, and the ability to let go, you know, to stop futzing around with it. And, you know, so his Vienna Beethoven was traditional Beethoven with micromanaging bits where he would slow down or speed up or do something just to annoy you and sort of break the musical line and nobody thought much of it. Nobody did. It was it was it was a non-happening. It was one of the least important recording projects ever. And it's really something when you're on Deutsche Grammophon and you're like their major artist, which Abbato was at the end of his life, more or less, the last 10 years of his life. He had the Berlin Philharmonic and you can't do Beethoven. That's a problem. So realizing that the Vienna Beethoven absolutely sucked. Oh, by the way, here's the cover, just so you could see what it looked like. So you know what to avoid. There it is. So knowing that that was a bow wow, he redid all the Beethoven symphonies and he decided to jump on the sort of historically informed performance bandwagon, sort of, kind of, and do it with a chamber-sized orchestra using the Jonathan Del Mar Urtext editions, which make no difference whatsoever, by the way. All this Urtext bullshit is just a way to keep the music in print and to get mechanical fees for, for you know, for the publishers. The, the, the fact that one thing is an Urtext and another thing isn't in these symphonies, which have been Urtextified about 50,000 times, since they were first published, makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. It's a joke. It's a, it's a gimmick. It, you know, the differences from one performance to the next are far greater than whether or not an accent was placed over one note or a slur was over a violin line. I mean, it just, it just doesn't matter. So let's be clear about that. But that was a selling point. So he used the Jonathan Del Mar or text editions and turned out one of the dullest Beethoven cycles in the history of humanity with the Berlin Philharmonic chamber, chambery, I mean, chambery was Zabato's thing. It was a way for him to be even more manipulative and less impactful. And the more manipulative and less impactful he could be, the happier he was in Beethoven and the more dreary it was for us listeners. So here is that Beethoven cycle. Poof! Whoopity boopity boopity boop. There you go. Something to avoid at all costs. Now, after that, he did a series of videos, DVDs in Italy of these same similar performances a year later. This came out in 2000, then in 2001, 
Um, he did a bunch of videos, and they were demonstrably better. It was pretty good. I mean, it was the approach was really good for the most part, and the performances, you know, they caught fire, and this was an issue because everybody knew that that initial Beethoven had sucked. And, you know, the critics who went to bat for it, talking about how wonderful it was, oh, didn't they have, you know, egg on their faces for getting behind DG within their knee-jerk reactions to all these things, which they generally do without having actually listened to the stuff. I mean, we don't have to go in there. It was a mess. And so, eventually, the soundtracks for those recordings came out. And they came out, I think it was around 2008 or rather shortly thereafter. But anyway, that here's what that one looks like. Ta-da! It's the red one there. There you go. And to make matters even more complicated, after that came out at full price for about 10 minutes, Deutsche Grammophon released it at a super budgie price. Cheapy, 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 cheap for like, I don't know, you know, they were practically paying us to take it off their hands. And here that one is. So there that is. That's the super cheapy budgie one. So what a mess this is. And by the way, they essentially issued a recall on the first one. God forbid, of course, they should refund the money of all the people who bought it, which they should have done. They should have said, if you bought our sucky first Berlin Beethoven cycle, we're going to give you the money back. And, you know, just tell us or send it back to us and we'll replace it with the new one. We'll do something. Of course, they didn't care. They didn't care about consumers. They didn't care about anything. So, so they said they were re deleting the first one. Well, they never deleted it. It was still around. It's still out there now. I mean, you can see it buzzing around. Um, they didn't. And it was expensive. And no doubt confused people bought it and, you know, thought they were getting something good. And maybe they didn't notice. I don't know. But in any case, so this new one came out and it was considerably better. And then, of course, there was the Abato Beethoven box and it's been repackaged and resold a million different ways. All of which goes to show just how incredibly insignificant Abato's Beethoven has been. Has anybody cared? Has anybody recommended it among the top Beethoven cycles? Does anybody think Claudio Abato was a born Beethoven conductor? I mean, the way DG handled it was guaranteed to make it as pointless and meaningless and irrelevant as anything in recorded history ever has been. And so I feel completely justified in adding this to the category of least important major recording projects ever. And it couldn't have been more major. I mean, think about it. Just think about it. First, you have Vienna which they, tough, who cares? Then they come up with the Berlin Phil on Deutsche Grammophon, <laughs> yellow label, Beethoven's hometown, Beethoven label, Beethoven people, right? And then they do DVDs, and then they make, they, they make, they make uh, CDs off of the soundtracks from the DVDs. And by the way, adding insult to injury, they did not redo the ninth. All they did was remaster it, which worked, by the way. They added bits and things and rejiggled it. But it's basically the same performance, just re-edited, all of which begs the question of how much of it was really Abato's conception at all, and, and how much of it really is representative of something that might have been like a coherent performance. I mean, ever? Really? Unbelievable. Simply unbelievable believable. How to take what should have been a big deal and make it completely insignificant. But, you know, they shouldn't have done it in the first place. It's not a crime to say, well, I'm not a Beethoven conductor. It just isn't. And Abato transparently wasn't, despite the fact that that last cycle was pretty good. It really was. I, I, I admit that. It had some wonderful moments and it was solid. It was really solid. It's just not important. It just doesn't matter compared to all of the other Beethoven cycles. I mean, compare that to, for example, if you want a chamber music -y version, Pavel Yarvi with the, the Deutsche Kammerphilomenie of Bremen. I mean, it's like a billion times more powerful and exciting. And it's the same basic approach. It really is. So, you know, we don't need this. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's totally unimportant. And the way DG did it and what they did to go through hoops for this man 
who had no concept of what he could and could not do um, and didn't care, didn't care about marketing, didn't care about whether or not the interpretations were representative. He just didn't care. He was living on his own planet. And now he's there permanently, actually, on his own planet. And I'm not saying that to be disrespectful. I'm just saying, you know, I mean, the huge Claudio Abado box is out. You think that's important? Nah, absolutely not. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.